preaching uh, about the campus. Is that it's been incredible hearing both the theory and also the practicals. I don't about you, know about you, but I'm ready to go on campus and crank it. And so now what we have is we're going to have a series of short charges, again, relating to campus ministry. We have Sharing Your Faith by Oleg Serotkin. Bringing Visitors by Sophia Serotkin. Winning Opinion Leaders by Raja Rajan. Oh, wait, b- sorry, before that, we have Leading Bible Studies by Miriam Chundula. Yeah. Then we have Winning Opinion Leaders by Raja Rajan. Persecution, because we know we're going to get some persecution, amen, but that's not going to discourage us, just like this brother, Chris uh, K. <laughs> We have one of the new shining stars in the London church, Answering Atheism by Luke Snow. And then finally, our father in the faith, Michael Williamson, speaking about inspirational Bible talks. So buckle up, get your pen and your notebook out, and get ready to hear the Word of God preached. Without further ado, I give you our incredible Russian brother, Oleg Sorokins. Amen. Good evening, guys. Uh, hi, hello from Moscow. Cheers. Uh, we brought eight people from Moscow, so I hope you will know them. Uh, and for us, it's a privilege to be here. I want to inspire you guys how to share your faith. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you like to share your faith? Yeah. About who? About Jesus, right? Jesus told us. It's simple. Uh, the same message we had and the same message uh, we go, you know, uh, repent and be baptized. Amen? Amen? Who's sharing your faith every day? Let's be honest. Let's be honest. Now, we have a problem. We not constantly love it, right? Let me inspire you. Uh, first of all, before you will share something, you need to have it. You want to share your money, you need to have it. If you empty, might be you don't have a lot of faith. And the Bible says Hebrews 11, 6, it's impossible. Please, God. So I, I want to call you, repent today. Amen. Just repent and make decision. Signs this moment. What time is it? 8 20. Amen. Make decisions. Share your faith every day. Amen. Amen. I will tell you a story. Let's open the Bible. Matthew 26. And the principle uh, is uh, simple. You know, when Jesus, before cross, uh, go to Gethsemane, the Bible said he took with him disciples. Why? Let's start the Bible. First of all, um, to be around him. But some disciple, he said, sit while go over and pray. 
Then he took three of them, Peter and son of Zebedee. Then he tell them, stay around me. And the secret is 39, going a little farther. He fell with his faith on the ground and prayed. Now, I do believe we need to go a little bit farther Amen. with our conviction. Because this is a, a heart of Christianity, sharing our faith. It's all about relationship. Now, if husband sh shame to share about his wife, might be he don't love his wife. And the same with kids. And the same must be with Lord. So I want to... Uh, you will ask yourself, what, are, what what's going on with me? And then, uh, 40, worse, he said, he returned to his disciple and found them sleeping. So I do believe, if we don't have a faith and we not multiply this faith, we are sleeping. Yeah. So I want to wake up you today, amen? amen. How? Yeah, well, first of all, story. Uh, Sophia tried to be creative with teens, you know. They said, uh, if government not give us opportunity to be allowed on the street, we will go to the churches, all denominational churches. So they took the best, hot, popular church in Moscow, and they go inside. And for the end of uh, service, uh, they move in and find the girl, teenagers, girls, sleeping inside of the service. Close to the wall, really good. So Anna say, uh, Sophia, let's invite her. So are you serious? Why is she sleeping, you know what? Well, uh, we need help. Remember Jesus prayed in Gethsemane and wake up everyone. Let's wake up everyone. And they wake up her. What is your name? And she was wake up, Sasha. Do you want to study the Bible? Why are you sleeping? Well, it's so boring here. <laughs> we brought the hot message, radical message. Do you want to wake up like spiritually? Yeah. I want to have a fun. I want a radical life. They said the Bible. She was baptized. Right after she brought her friends and she baptized her and friend brought her brother and, she and he studied the Bible. Now, this is a secret. You know what? Uh, why Jesus was back to his quiet time three times? Do you know why? Nobody knows. But I guess <laughs> he was not ready. Right. Now, how is your quiet time? <laughs> if you go into the quiet time and blame on God and follow back to your job empty, yeah. no faith, no joy, maybe you need to be back. <laughs> and after second time, you are empty. Might be you need to be back. And then when Jesus was fulfilled with Holy Spirit, he said, I'm ready. I will go to the cross. How is your quiet time today? One of the practical uh, challenge, we challenge brothers, you know, uh, one of, uh, we have a conversation. Um, he said, I forget when I baptize people. I, I feel empty. What can I do? I said, pray and fasting. If you're not really fruitful and you don't have a study many months, you dry. You need a water. Okay. He said, well, well, but I try. I share my faith every day. What are you looking for? Open people. What question do you ask? So I give him challenge to find three answers. Three yes. Do you believe in God? Yes. Do you uh, want to study the Bible? Yes. Do you want to be baptized? Yes. 
It's easy. So, okay. So many people say, maybe. Let's try. I said, don't, don't, don't follow them. Find three yes. He did it. Last week, we baptized new guy, Igor. He said three yes. He find it. Now, uh, Romans 1, 16, what is the power of God? When you're sharing your faith, right? So for the end of story, remember, guys, I like London. The best idea what I find in London in this conference about sharing my faith, 3-1. One. one visitors, Colby challenged me today. He said, this is what we are doing. I give for everyone member of my region. Find one visitors on study, one visitors for Bible talk, and one study. Who want to study the Bible? And they start to bring many visitors. I will do in Moscow. Pray for us. Thank you so much. Hi guys, my name is Sofia and I also come from the Moscow church. Um, so I arrived as the only teen to Moscow about almost four years ago and since then we've grown into three Bible talks and even into a whole sector. So I think and actually now we have five teen Bible studies and uh, four of them are not kingdom kids. So, <laughs> so I think I can tell you something about bringing visitors which is the title of my lesson today. So uh, uh, let's open Daniel chapter 12. Starting, I mean, verse 3. Uh, it says, find it. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Wow. So, wisdom is a great thing. Uh, we can divide it into a part called knowledge. And you know, knowledge of the Bible is really great. You know, studying the Bible is amazing during quiet time. I think listening to all of these nuggets during lessons, hearing practicals from the Bible, and sharing it with other people is really incredible. People don't know about the Bible well, yes. but that's not what's gonna bring you visitors. Actually, um, love converts more than the truth. It's not your biblical knowledge. And information can be found absolutely everywhere. We can find it on the internet, about the Bible, uh, in other books, reading the Bible, talking to other people about opinions. But love that we possess as disciples cannot be found anywhere in the world. The Christ's love that we must share with other people. And so I would also like to share a story. It's actually a continuation of what my dad was sharing about the girl named Sasha. So he shared about how we invited her, but I'm going to share about the process of um, bringing her out to church. So when we came up to her, actually, um, we didn't say, hey, so do you want to study the Bible? The first thing I did, I said, um, I like your dress a lot. Yeah. And she said, oh, that's great. And I said, what's your name? So we started speaking and speaking and speaking, and I found a little bit about her life. And then we, hey, let's meet up sometime, you know, maybe grab some coffee. And she said, okay. So we did that, and guess what we did? We didn't open a single scripture the whole time. Now why? Why do I say this? Because I was trying to be wise. I was trying to love her. I was talking to her. I was, she was telling me about her life because um, she's got a lot of problems. People have got a lot of problems out there. Her parents were getting divorced. She, was, she had a disease and she was in the hospital for a long time. Her sister has heart problems. Her sister's like seven years old. She was struggling. And I said, wow, it's like really amazing. So let's meet up sometime again, sure. We do it and guess what we did that time? We went to a museum. It was fun, it was very fun and we got to know her a lot better. And then the fourth time we met up, we opened scriptures. Now why do I say we opened scriptures and didn't study the Bible? Because she had no idea we were studying the Bible with her. I just, in helping her with her life, saying, I care for you, you know, I care for your life. I care about you and I want to help you. And I opened scriptures and we went through three studies without her realizing she was studying the Bible. <laughs> the girl I was studying with her, um, her name is Anna. She also, I studied the Bible with her without her realizing she was studying the Bible. And then the girl, Sasha, of course, she got baptized, it's great. And she brought her friend while she was studying the Bible, who we also met up with, and she didn't know she was studying the Bible with. Again, why? 
Because love converts more than the truth. We can't go to people and f like just push knowledge into them. You know, this is right, this is what I want from you. I want you to go to Christ and it's gonna be great and your life's gonna change. If you don't want it, bye. No, really, it's not what Jesus did. Jesus lived, breathed, ate with his disciples. He ate with his disciples. And that's why we've gotta get to know the people we're with. Uh, we've got to come up to them and say, hey, tell me about your life. I want to know you. I don't want to just shove knowledge into you. I want, I want us to be friends. And that keeps them in the kingdom later on. It keeps them, you know, it keeps them stronger. It makes them know that they're not just here because, you know, some girl invited me and she's like, just like the other denominations, get it, giving me knowledge. Instead, we're here to love one another. Therefore, I want you to remember that people in the world are starving for love. So therefore, next time when you meet somebody on the street, maybe it's a good idea to come up to them and say, hey, I really like your dress. Um, I think, I think, well, you know, where did you get it? That's really great. You know, it's for girls. I don't know what guys, you can talk about football. I don't know what guys talk about. <laughs> um, yeah, so truly care for people. And you will be guaranteed to bring out visitors because people trust you. They know you're there for them and they know you're there as their friend which is what we're all here for. And they will become brothers and sisters because all three of the girls I've ever tried this on, all three of them got baptized, all three of them are faithful, and all three of them are bringing visitors. So, just remember that knowledge is not the most important part of wisdom in this particular case. And love converts more than the truth. Thank you. Good evening, family. My name is Miriam Chundula, and I am a disciple in the East Region of the London Church. <laughs> um, and the charge I've been given for you guys today is on leading Bible studies. Turn with me to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2. So 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 to 10, it reads, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And we know from Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20, that disciples make disciples. So what is leading Bible studies? Leading Bible studies really for me is what is in the scripture here. And the whole point of it is that all the characteristics and all the traits it speaks about in this scripture, you have to hold in order to give them to someone else, in order to impart them to someone else. So my first area to just cover is identity. So, you know, it says you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Before we ever touch seeking God with anyone, we have to believe that on a heart level. We have to believe that we are a holy nation, a chosen people, a royal priesthood priesthood on a heart level and for a long time I believed that in my head but it wasn't connecting to my heart and I found it difficult to connect to young women because I didn't believe it for myself and I had no faith for them either and I really really want to emphasize that you must go after God and going after your identity and who God has called you to be and the next part I just want to cover on this is where it speaks about declaring God's praises. You've got your identity, you know you're a royal priesthood, you know everything's good, and it says declaring God's presence. And when you actually translate this it to, into the Greek, it's exangelo, which basically means to give a good report. I really want to emphasize to you sisters that when we go into studies, like Sophia said, it's not just pushing information into people. It's not just, you know, telling them this is what you do to get get saved you have to declare the praises of God as a person who's leading studies you have two roles you declare the praises of God and you call the person studying with you to do the same so people can leave studies thinking wow God is awesome God is great not all oh, my days I have another study I need to do no you know I'm not a disciple you know all these things it's great sometimes I hear brothers and sisters we all say things like I can't wait to get them a discipleship or they'll understand it at the 
kingdom study, you know? But are we really calling these people to declare the praises of God when we're studying the Bible with them? We have to have the heart to do that because that's the only way we're going to make effective disciples is when we call them to declare God's praises and they're not just following, but they're leading in declaring God's praises. And I just really want to also challenge you finally on a couple of things, even in declaring God's presence, I want to challenge you to flesh out your studies. So the seeking God is what? Seven, eight scriptures. I want you to find eight, eight more, eight more to find to flesh out the seeking God study about why it's important to write. For example, it's important to write Habakkuk 2.2. It says, make it plain on tablets so that the runner who sees it may run with it. So make it plain on paper that whoever reads it can run with it. I want, I want to challenge you sisters to really go after fleshing out every single study so that you can declare the praises of God to greater effect and ultimately make great campus disciples. To God be all the glory. Amen. Let's be turning a Bible's book of Acts chapter 24. Okay. Acts 24. My title is Winning Opinion Leaders. <laughs> now before I go ahead and uh, talk about this, in Delhi, we have not really done this. It's an honest confession. Uh, I want to talk about what we did in, in Chennai. Uh, and so uh, let's go to Acts chapter 24, on, verses 24 and 25. Acts 24, 24 and 25. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. As Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. I believe over here, Paul was trying to convert an opinion leader, yeah. Yeah. Felix the governor. Uh, you know, when I think about opinion leaders, for me, I think they are people who are either doing their masters or their PhD degrees. Bachelor's guys, campus, but you know, that's the kind of what guys you want to go and influence. Uh, I have something that's called a shock method. You got to be a shock when you want to go after these opinion leaders. Uh, we have, in China we had Baptists about five uh, PhD guys, about eight masters, uh, one double masters, sorry, three double masters and, and five PhDs. And one of the things I saw was, if you are the top leader, then you are involved with them. They don't like to, they don't like to talk to, to goldfish. They want to talk to top guys. They want to know who's the top guy. To bring him on because they want to talk about their opinions. They want to say this. They want to say that. And if you go, oh, you know, my leader, they go, no, 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 this is not going to work. <laughs> Number two, you got to get personal. You see, Paul over here was very personal. He engaged with this guy and he talked about three things, righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come. People do fear God. You bring it upon them. You know, you go, you go, oh, but atheists don't believe in God. No, you know, let me tell you, atheists have a belief. Their belief is not wanting to believe in God. That is a belief in itself. And you bring in God and tell them, you know, you got to you, engage that guy. That's, a, that's what you do. You bring him on and, and engage the person. And I also, I think uh, uh, one of the things that uh, I, I, did, I did with people was, and this, is they want to see your commitment. They are watching you. They want to know how committed you are. They want to know your conviction. They want to know your family. They want to know what you believe in. They want to know what you eat. They want to know your bedroom. Is it clean? Do you make your beds? They can't just, hey, and then they want to check out your bathrooms. But they want to know how clean you are. They have an opinion, and they'll tell you on your face about what they like and they don't like. But that's the kind of people they are. You know, one of the things that's up, uh, Painful for me is I lost one of the guys. We have four of them, four PhDs, in, 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 I mean, three in Chennai, one in Delhi. And uh, his name is Ben. He is my son. He's come to New Delhi, shifted to Punjab, 
drifted into sin. And, uh, you know, there's not a day that goes by, I don't pray for him, I, think, I don't think about him. But one of the things of being, wanting to convert opinion leaders is keeping that pain in your heart and not hardening your heart. Yeah. When they walk away, yeah. that's why you're going to be a shock. And say, once I get you, I'm going to pull you with me to heaven. To God be all the glory. Thank you so much. Uh, I just want to say it's a privilege to, to be given the chance to preach here. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you so much, Kobe, and everyone else who's brought me to this spot. But I've been given the chance to speak about persecution. And today I want to speak to the students here. If you're a bit older, listen as well, but to the students, I'm speaking to you. You see, today, the, the young people today like the easy way of life. They like the instant stuff, the, the easy route. I mean, if I told you that you could look like Frank by having a protein shake, I wouldn't look like this today. We like the easy way. Amazon, deliveries, next day, compromises, easy way, but in Christianity, that's not the way it happens. And the title of my charge today is that compromise nullifies the sacrifice. Let's turn the Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. You see, there are two types of people in this room today. Those who are dedicated and those who make excuses. I hope by this end of the conference, you can be dedicated to the word of God. You see, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul starts the chapter by telling the, the disciples in Corinth that they have the truth. That they have the very words of God in their hands. That they are special. That the light of Christ is in the bodies. And I told you guys today that each and every single person here is special. Each and every single young person here, whether you're 17, 15, 20, you are special. Don't let the world tell you otherwise. In Europe, there's the there's idea that, that you're, not, you're not good enough. I can't do this. I can do that. Everyone here is special. And verse 8, the Bible reads, We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our bodies the death of Jesus. So that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our bodies. The, the, the Greek word here for hard press is, 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 is a symbol of, of someone being pressurized. Like, like someone being caved in. And the Greek word here is the same word used in Matthew chapter 7, verse 14. When, the, when Jesus says, hey, the way to heaven is, is short and narrow. You see, persecution gets us ready for the way to heaven. It says we are, we are persecuted, but we are not crossed. We are not crossed. The Greek word here means that we, we keep our shape. When you get persecuted, do you keep your shape or do you compromise? It carries on by saying, by, hey, you are, we are perplexed, but not in despair. The word here, perplexed, means to be in doubt. When, when, when you're a campus student and you, and you match your life and your doctrine together, your parents, your family members may, may persecute you. And one day you can be in doubt. Do I need to be in church on Sunday? Do I need to go to that D group? Do I need to, to, to go to that, to that birthday party that, my, that the disciples are holding? I mean, I just want to do so much work. We, 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 we just come in doubt about the scriptures. But the Bible says that we may be perplexed, but not in despair. That word means that the resources are available for us to overcome. The word of God is available for everyone. Whether you're in doubt, the word of God is there to blow all the doubt away. It says persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. And, and uh, I was baptized in uh, 2016, um, <laughs> April 24th, and my sister was, was a disciple before I was a disciple, and she was like, Chris, let's study the Bible, and I was like, no. <laughs> but eventually I found out that my life was boring, and I was like, okay, let me study the Bible. 
And, and, and my dad would literally persecute my sister when I was a non-disciple. He was like, Deborah, get out of the house. If you want to become a Christian, I don't want to see you again. Guess what? You're no longer my daughter. So I knew if I became a disciple, I was going to get that times 10. <laughs> so I was like, we had Bible studies, and I was like, oh my goodness, this is the truth. So I decided to dedicate my life to Christ. But the moment I got baptized, my dad was in Nigeria. So I didn't tell him about it. He came back, and then I was like, Dad, I joined my sister's church. Oh, it was frightening. My dad is around six foot three African man. He, 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 he frightened me. He shouted me so much, so much emotional abuse. And, and I compromised in my faith. I decided that I don't need to go to church on Sunday. My dad said I can't go. I'm just going to go to the Catholic Mass. And then um, uh, on Fridays, I go to Bible talk. I, 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 I compromised and I nullified the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Because the fear of my dad was more important than Christ's, Christ's death. But then I spoke to some brothers. And then I decided to be dedicated to Christianity. I decided to be hardline. And, and I read a scripture in Daniel. And, 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 and the scripture was when Daniel was, was, was struggling, just like I was. And then he prayed to Christ, he prayed to God for strength. And an angel came down and touched his lips. And I remember going to school, thinking, what am I going to do with my life at the age of 17? And I just prayed that scripture, and I decided to be dedicated, and God changed my life. I asked for the strength, and all of a sudden, I, I felt strong. I was dedicated to the mission. I want to ask you, are you guys going to compromise if persecution comes your way? Are you going to compromise? Because if you want to do even greater things, there'll be even greater persecution. Your parents will come after you. Your friends will come after you. Are you going to compromise? Are you going to compromise? See, persecution gives you conviction. Compromise stunts spiritual growth. Persecution makes us look more like Jesus. Who do you look like today? We need to understand and appreciate the sacrifice that Christ done for us. Persecution exposes our hearts, and a person with deep, rooted faith will be strengthened. And it's just a decision for you young people. You 18, 17, 20-year-olds that live with your parents, your parents of your life, if they come against you, are you going to decide to choose Christ over them? I want to challenge you guys. Never give in. Kiara, never compromise. Emmanuel, never give in. Miguel, never compromise. Dylan, never give in. Aji, never compromise. The Kappa students, never, ever give in. And whenever you're going through struggles or hardships in your life, I want you guys to search through your scriptures. Search through the Bible to find a person in the scriptures who went through the same struggles. And imitate their faith and imitate their prayer life. And watch God move the struggles out of the way. <laughs> to close, compromise nullifies the sacrifice. But if we remain dedicated, we will not regret it. We will evangelize the nations in this generation. And to God be the glory. <laughs> All right. Let's do it. Turn your Bibles to Psalm 9. My name is Luke Snow. I'm from the North Region in the London Church. And the title I've been given tonight is Answering Atheism. And I'm sure you want to know the answer. Psalms 9. Verse 17 says, The wicked go down to the realm of the dead. All the nations that forget God. All the nations that forget God. Family, I want to tell you right now that atheists are in hell. They are not damned. They're not going to hell. It's not a matter of the fact that they don't have their salvation right now. They are in hell now. Hell is the absence of God. They don't know God. They don't have God. They don't have a purpose. They don't have responsibility. They don't have accountability. Atheists are in hell. 
I know that because I was an atheist for 22 years. I had no purpose, no responsibility. My life was lost. Aimlessly, I went around taking cocaine, ecstasy, mushrooms, weed, drinking copious amounts of alcohol. I could have died plenty of times. I should have died plenty of times. I was lost chasing women, STIs, chasing money, chasing a career. My heart was yearning for something. There was a hole bigger than the world inside my heart and I could not fill it with anything. I was broken. I'm telling you now that every single atheist on the planet is in the exact same position that I was in. With a hole in their heart. And we know how to fill it. My parents didn't believe in God. My family didn't believe in God. I was spiritually starving at the point where some true disciples came to me. But I tell you, my heart was so empty, I would have been fired up to fill it with anything. And that's why I chased drugs. That's why I chased alcohol. That's why I chased a career because I would fill my heart with absolutely anything anyone was able to offer me. I'm so thankful to God that it was a true disciple that came to me because I know if a Buddhist came and told me I've got the truth, if a Muslim came and told me they got the truth, I would have gone, okay, and went with them. I was yearning for something more. And God blessed it that a true disciple came into my life. I've got one point for you, family. One point, my charge is answering atheism. My point is give them the answer. If you think that you don't have the answer, you have no faith. We are lost in a world where we have the most powerful tool that God has given us. We have given us a sword. God has given us this Bible that is full of things that cut people to the heart. So why do we not use it? We waste our time, family, and I thank you so much, Raul, and, and all the awesome disciples that have written brilliant books that sharpen us and sharpen us in our faith. But we waste our time in, in studying things like psychology and ethics and biology to try and get a stance over the atheists. To think, if I know more about this, I'm going to be able to impact them in a greater way. These things will not work. We see in First Peter that Peter tells us, oh, you need to be able to give an answer to those who, who need proof of your faith. I'm sure he wasn't calling them to go and get degrees in these things and, and go and read a boring old book. He was saying, use what you already have, what Christ has given you. Use your testimony to attack these people, to go after their hearts. That's what we need to do. If you're going into battle, you're not going to get yourself a mace, sling a hammer over your back, get your bow and arrow and get a dagger over here and get another thing and you're walking around and you're trying to fight a fight that is ineffective. You are only needing to fight with the word for your sword and your faith for your shield. That is all you need in this spiritual battle. That's all you need. I really struggled in my Seeking God study because the disciples kept on telling me was, God's calling you. God's crying out to you. You've, you've asked, you've seeked, you've knocked, and, and God's, God's given you that answer. I'm like, yeah, but I've not asked. I've not seeked, and I've not knocked. So where is this answer coming from? How has God appeared to me when I've not even asked him for him? I don't deserve this. In Psalms 84, verse 2, it says, My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. I did not know it, but for 22 years in my life, until five months ago, my heart was crying out because I was empty. And God heard that cry. God heard that cry because my heart was just broken to pieces. And God heard the hole in my heart. Everyone, every single atheist has a massive gaping hole in their heart. And Deuteronomy 8, it tells us that God starves us. God humbles us. He starves us so that when we get that manna, that delicious, delicious manna, it tastes oh so good. Serve them up a steaming plate of Bible. Give them that manna. Give them that God that's going to quench their hunger. They are all spiritually starving and you already have the answer. You already have the answer. Are you going to give it to them? I've got a simple practical. This is only going to work if you're disciples with faith. And I'm not trying to call anyone out. I am trying to call people out. I'm not trying to call anyone out. But I want you to look through your contact list. Figure out those people who are atheists. Think, these people have a hole in their heart. Look through the Psalms. Because I realized as I was trying to write this charge, I kept on going back to the Psalms. 
There's so much manna in there. There's so much nourishment. There's so much heart-filling scriptures. I want you to pick a specific psalm for each atheist in your contact list and send it to them. You don't need to say, this is Psalm, da, 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 da. just send them the words and see if your faith carries God's word and that does not impact them. I challenge you to believe that that will make a difference. That that scripture that says that their heart is empty and the only thing that can fill it is God, watch them crumble. Watch them come to you and beg for more of God's words. Do it, family. I want to leave you with a closing scripture. I don't want to leave you kind of faithless saying that atheists in hell and ain't got no chance. I'm going to go back to that same scripture I started off with. The wicked go down to the realm of the dead, all the nations that forget God. But God will never forget the needy. The hope of the afflicted will never perish. You have the answer. Please give it to them. Please give it to them. To God be the glory. You know, I want to first of all thank those who spoke tonight. Oh my goodness. <laughs> wow, Luke, an incredible job. Everybody, please give them a round of applause. We've heard some great charges. You know, the title I've been given is Inspirational Bible Talks. And I thought about it, and it is Inspirational Bible Talks, not Sinspirational Bible Talks. And, um, you, 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 you go, you know, you start off with that music. You know, all of our Bible talks start like that. We get the music going because we want people to be blessed. We want them to be happy. The Bible says in Acts chapter 5 in verse 42, day after day, in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stop teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. The church is built from house to house. In Acts chapter 8 in verse 3, the Bible says, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. The church is built from house to house. The church is destroyed from house to house. The Bible says here in Genesis chapter 1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. I pray that's not your Bible talk. Actually, we'll stop right there. We don't need Bible talks that are formless and empty. They got to be inspirational. And so your Bible talk has to have H, structure and order and protocol. In our Bible talk, we have, we have structure, order and protocol. Number one, we start on time. <laughs> we start on time. Number two, we have a clean house. I got to make sure our marriage is doing well. So I make sure the house is good right there and it's very clean. You got to have a clean house to make sure your Bible talk is inspirational. You got to have the candles lit. We have diffusers going on. We just, it, you know, we, we just, it's got to be, people got to come in and smell the aroma of Christ, not the stench of death right there. We don't have a snack schedule for our Bible talk. We have a dinner schedule. Why? Because you're at Bible talk. You're spending a long time. People are traveling, stuff like that. You want to have a hearty meal. And we have some awesome food. Some people don't even come for the message. They just come for the fellowship and the food. You got to have structure, order, and protocol. You got to have a social media presence. You got to have a social media presence if you want an inspirational Bible talk. We have a video that we send. We don't even send people just a card invitation. We send a video invite. A video invite and it shows the different things that we do the activities the fun stuff you got to have that present uh, you got to have aw an awesome Bible talk name and this is where our Bible talk was in sin we live in what's called Golders Green and so for a while we were called the Golders Green Bible talk 
Golders Green. Who wants to go to a Golders Green Bible talk? It's so terrible. And I, I don't know what you, you know, you may want to call yourself the faith busters, the gospel gangsters, the new Christians on the block. I don't know what it is. You got to get a good name. You got to have an awesome Bible talk name. You can't call it Bible talk. Bible talk. I mean, non-Christians don't know what you're talking about. Bible talk. What do you mean? You got to have a good name. Uh, it, wherever you have, you got to have good lighting. You got to have good lighting right there. Uh, every Bible talk has to have a group sniper. If you want an inspirational Bible talk. A sniper is the person that takes on the person that takes on you. And you always get that person to come to your Bible talk and they ask the question that's super controversial and put you in a position. You got to argue with them. All the disciples are wondering what you say. Well, you train your Bible talk to have a sniper, somebody. And I always like to have a sister. Hard to have a bad attitude at a sister. A sister, I can answer that question right here. The Bible says right there, here, da, 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 da. You have to be baptized. That actually wasn't the topic of the speech tonight. If we could actually keep it on the topic, that would be great. And I go, wow, she just spoke right there. There's the answer right there. You got to have a sniper so you can keep it inspirational. It's not the time for you to go into a Bible study. You got to have a, a sniper. Uh, you got to have inspirational group activities. Uh, number two, you got to have awesome topics and titles. Uh, awesome topics and titles. I, I, I just, I think long and hard how to have great topics, great titles to keep everybody engaged. I did one Bible talk called Trump. Trump. Oh, yeah, exactly. Everybody's like, oh, where's he going with this one here? And it was an acronym, just like Raul says. I love these little acronyms, stuff like that. The reality you must pray. And that pulls in those here because they're all mad at Trump and everything. And I just say, hey, you need to pray and all that stuff. But I use that as an opportunity to preach the word of God right there, okay? Another one. The God in your pocket. That's another Bible talk we've done. The God that's in your pocket. And of course, what is the God in your pocket? No. It's a cell phone. But I use that one too, money. That's a good one. We did a Bible talk called STDs. STDs, spiritually transmitted diseases. We did a Bible talk called Gracism. Gracism. With all the racism, we need God's grace. We did a Bible talk called Homosexuality. To be or not to be? That is the question. We did a Bible talk called, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Because the faith, of the atheists say, hey, well, you believe in the beginning there's a God. I go, well, you're just as religious as I am. The difference is that you're dishonest about it. I say in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. You say in the beginning, nothing created everything. It takes more faith to believe that than to believe in the beginning, God created everything. You're just as religious as me, you're just not honest about it. And I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. That was a Bible talk. We had people come out to it. We did one called God and Science Are Homies. We did one called Taking a Selfie Through the Eyes of God. I mean, we just come with these great, try to get some titles, get people going to really engage with the Word of God. Are you with me here? You got to have powerful participation. We send out, I send out the topic a week in advance. I get everybody engaged. I make sure that they know exactly what the opening question is so that we have participation. It can't just be you. You got to have the members sharing. They got to be sharing their faith and sharing in the discussion. Remember, it is a Bible talk discussion. I put people on the spot. I make the members give their heart and have something power to share. That keeps the inspiration in the Bible talk. You got to have people. What good is it if you have this awesome topic, awesome title, all this good food, you got the diffusers, you got the joy, you're all happy, and nobody comes? It's pointless. The purpose of Bible talk is baptizing. <laughs> That's the purpose. We do all this so we can get a baptism, but you got to have some people there. Amen? And lastly, you just got to have fun. I mean, I, I, boring Bible talk is sin. And I know when I stop wanting to come to Bible talk or I don't want to come to Bible talk, I am in sin. I've, I've stopped being inspirational. And when I stop being inspirational, it's mean I'm, I'm not getting my inspiration from God. Are, are you with me right here? Let's take all these principles right here. Let's put them into practice. Let's have some inspirational Bible talks. I love you. To God be all the glory. Let's give an amazing round of applause for these incredible speakers. That's right, you can stand up for them. Let's, let's, let's go, people, let's go. They preach their hearts out for this. Sir. 
Oleg, sharing your faith. He said, he talks this hit me as a husband because he says, uh, husbands, they love their wives and I love my wife. And I talk about her all the time. And I, when I think about sharing my faith is that I don't want to be thinking more about my wife and talking more about my wife than I am about my God. Is that, uh, this is the thing is that we, we love to talk about what we love. And if we don't love to talk about God, that shows there's a problem with our relationship with God. And I think that for us to, to share our faith, we need to just fall more in love with God. And the more in love we fall in God, the more we're going to be able to do it. Sophia, bringing visitors. She was talking about uh, love converts more than the truth. Is that this hits me because uh, I'm on Imperial where it's all science, technology, facts. They, and the people come to me, they want to talk about these types of things. But the truth is that the first two months on, this, on the campus haven't been that effective. And when I say haven't, they really haven't been effective. We haven't really been able to move people's hearts because we've been back and forth battling about the truth. And as she said, love converts more than the truth. And I think she has a very powerful example that I want to call all, everyone here tonight. We got to follow her example. We got to learn from the young leaders that are raising up and we need to love people into the kingdom. Miriam spoke about leading Bible studies, and those in London know that this girl knows how to crank some Bible studies. She spoke about having that identity, is that if you don't have your identity with God, you're not going to be able to give it to anyone else. Is that if you haven't had a crank and quiet time, don't try and tell someone else to have a crank and quiet time. Don't try to get someone else to see God if you're not seeking God. And I think that uh, what she was talking about is declaring the praises. I love that in the Greek, she talked about giving a good report. Is that do we give the people in the world that we study the Bible with a good report about God? Do we give them a good report about Jesus, about the kingdom of God? Is that this is what we need to do. We need to be telling them about the greatness of God, not trying to convince them how wrong they are. And I think that what she said is, is very true. And I've seen it as well in disciples that they want to like, oh, just wait till discipleship, then they're going to get it. Yeah, they will, but then you won't really move their hearts. And I think that for us is that just like all of it, it's all about love. I don't know if you, got, you keep hearing that theme over and over again. I keep hearing it's all about love. If we want to move people's hearts, we have to love them into the kingdom. We have to show them the love of God, not the truth of the Bible. Of course the Bible is true but that's not what's gonna move their hearts. It's gonna be the love that we show them and the love that God shows them. You with me, guys? Raja, winning opinion leaders. And I, amen, bro, you're gonna get some great opinion leaders in Delhi. It's, uh, it's amazing to see the opinion leaders that he's come out of Chennai, and I've met them, and these guys crank. And he talked about the shark method is that top guys want to be with the top guys. And this is, a sh this is really convicting for me and the other region leaders, is that, hey, we can't delegate those tough people. We can't offload them onto someone else. We got to latch onto them. And I think that uh, thinking of the, the masters and the PhD people is that uh, Tomiwa was a master's student. And he, yeah, he's a pretty cranking guy. And it took Michael Williams and the top guy to get in there. Sing it, Stephen. No, you are going to come to heaven with me. You're not going anywhere. I'm not going to let you go until you become a disciple. And that's what it takes, is that it takes hard work to win these opinion leaders. But if we really, really go after it, we'll be able to. Uh, Chris, speaking about persecution. Again, is that I, to, to me, this speaks so much more powerfully because I know his story is that I was in the East region when this guy was going through hell, that his dad was threatening him. His dad was intimidating him. His dad was constantly harassing him, constantly on him, constantly persecuting him. And we've all had moments of weakness. And I really appreciate him sharing vulnerably about his weaknesses. But now he can preach from strength. He has an incredible example about standing firm in persecution. And we know that everyone that wants to live a godly life will be persecuted. And I think I want to inspire you guys is that whether you're in persecution right now, whether you've been in persecution in the past, whether you will be persecuted in the future, stand firm. Your brothers and sisters all over the world are experiencing the same trials. 
And I think I'm so proud of him. What he speaks about that, that persecution is that compression. And it, just seeing that the, Jesus said the road is narrow, the road is compressed. So persecution compresses us to keep us on that narrow road, to help us get to heaven. If that's what it takes for me to get to heaven, give me some more persecution, amen? Anyone else want some of that? Because I want to make it to heaven no matter what it takes. Luke, answering atheism. Is that, if, if you're like me, atheists, atheists are intimidating. Is that I, I would, if I met someone on the street that was a Sikh or a Muslim or a Buddhist or anything, I'd be, oh, great, awesome. But an atheist, they're challenging. They challenge our faith. And I think that what he said to us, we need to have faith. We need to have faith for the atheists. And he, he, he shared about Psalms. And he said that atheists are in hell today, right here, right now. How many atheists are out destroying their lives across London on a Friday night? They're trying to drown out their pain. They're trying to forget their problems. Is that I saw this advertisement for uh, alcohol and it said, alcohol doesn't answer the, uh, doesn't give you the answer, but it makes you forget the question. Wow. See, this is what sin does. And atheists, they just, they want to forget so badly. They'll run and do whatever it takes. And guess who's converting atheists? Muslims. Guess who's converting atheists? Buddhists. And he said it. He's like, man, I was just so desperate. I would have gone with anyone. Thank God I met true disciples that could give me the truth. Again, what, what converted him was not some deep intellectual understanding. It was love. It was the love of God. It was the hope that comes from the word of God. Looking at the Psalms, that, that nourishing spiritual manna. And I love this challenge. Is that you know, he was going through the Psalms and it's like, those are some cranking Psalms. And if you go through this, there's a lot of Psalms and there's a lot of cranking Psalms. There's so many scriptures. Is that you can have a ton of atheists in your phone and I guarantee you, you can find personal Psalms for each and every one of them. I want to take this challenge to heart. I want to be able to use this. I've got a long list of atheists at Imperial College that are going to be getting a lot of Psalms tonight. Amen. <laughs> You have uh, Michael, our father in the faith, wrapping it up with inspirational Bible talks. And I mean, did you not feel inspired with that music? Yeah. I think that for us to be inspirational, we got to think outside the box. And this is what I love about Michael. He's so creative. Is that he was just listing these things off. Like, that's just a, a thing that God has blessed him with, to have this incredible creativity. And people love it. For those of you that have had the pleasure to be at his Bible talk, everyone is fired up. They love it. They're happy. And this is what we need to do. We need to provide a safe place, a family, where people can come and escape from the world and have that momentary relief. Just for that hour, just for that half an hour, where they can come, wow, I can experience some love. I can be safe. I can be inspired. I can feel joy. That's what our Bible talks need to be. And I think that it's not just enough to be making disciples. If we're really going to get the church to have explosive growth, we need to build Bible talks. As he said, the church is built from house to house, Bible talk to Bible talk. And I think that to have inspirational Bible talks, we need to have inspirational leaders. We need more people raising up, saying, I want a Bible talk. I want to be able to take a portion of the wall. I want to be able to build things up. And I think that he gave us so many great practicals. And we just need to do it. Is that I'm fired up. As I, I've been through his, uh, I've done some of his Bible talks on him. They loved it. And so learn from him, talk to him afterwards, be able to ask, okay, give me some more of these things. Give me tips, give me practicals because he has got them for days. And so uh, that's it for tonight, guys. Uh, we, we have one announcement. Tomorrow is gonna be Mercy Day. And so if you uh, have never been to a Mercy Day before, what you do is you bring your green Mercy shirt. And what we have tomorrow is that we have the new Mercy shirts. Now, uh, I haven't seen them, but I heard they crank. Like they're still green, but it's like a cranking, cranking green. They're awesome. And so if you don't have a Mercy shirt, you're going to be able to buy them. They're 10 pounds. Or even if you do and you just want another one just because they're awesome, go ahead and you can buy another Mercy shirt tomorrow morning. I think uh, we're going to have one final song. Yep. And am I singing it? Uh... <laughs> awesome. Our brother Joseph is going to lead us and go and make disciples. Let's go and stand up and sing, Go and Make Disciples.
I call this bridge the Isles, guys. Let's be united and see, go and make disciples. Well, he said, he said to go to every nation. He said.